Kai and Patria Mitchell from Mitchell Gaines Fine Arts. We're here with Amy Arbus, and we're going to be talking about her wonderful photographs from her book, On the Street, 1980 to 1990. So can you tell us about The Clash, this fabulous photograph? <laughs> Thank you. I was living on the Upper West Side, um, which wasn't as cool as living downtown. But I, I used to take the opportunity to walk downtown and just look around and get sort of psyched to do the pictures for my page. And I knew the Clash were in town because they were playing for five nights. And of course, we had tickets to see them. And one day, there they were. And I was wondering what was going on because it seemed sort of like it turned out to be a set for Martin Scorsese's King of Comedy. And they were waiting to be extras in the film. And even though they weren't shooting, I just thought, well, I can't interrupt them. So I just took a picture of exactly the way that they were standing. So were they aware of that they were being photographed? Did you have a conversation with them at Nothing. all? Or? Wow. Which is totally unlike how I work. But they were so perfect in their body language and their coolness and, you know, everybody looking a different way and the clothes and even the stuff, like the stuff that I like to clean up, mm -hmm. the trash, and it all works for, for me for this photograph. How many shots did you have to take until you got the perfect one? You know, I don't know that I thought, oh, that's a killer uh -huh. picture. I, I mean, they're thought, all in such perfect positions. Yeah. yeah, no, I was thinking, oh my God, it's The Clash. <laughs> and who are the other people? Like, I didn't get, like, who was belonging to who, and were they all, you know, I knew they weren't all in the band, but I was just so excited. I don't think I kept shooting. I think there were three frames. I mean, oh, I just wow. did it and walked away. Yeah, the magic happened really quickly. Well, you know, when, in those days, that was 1981, that was really early for me, and I wasn't thinking about making great photographs. I was thinking about capturing style on the streets of New York, mm -hmm. and I was like, that's some style. And then as I worked over the course of the years, you know, by 83, I was really kind of designing the pictures a lot more with backgrounds that didn't interrupt the foreground and mm -hmm. cleaning up the trash on the street and you know, I was much more, more conscious of what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And it turns out now, I feel like I'm so glad I got that picture because they're barely in the film. So it was to me like this wonderful gift from the photo gods. To me, I captured that moment of them coming and being in New York and how cool that was. And it's so neat the way you had, this is so beautifully composed, it's not like you're saying, can you turn your head, can you do that, can you be smoking a cigarette, can you bring in a fan? It's just beautifully composed with what you caught. Well, truth be yeah. told, I, I couldn't have posed them as well as they are standing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> can you talk about Zero T-shirts? Sure. Um, these... Rosenberg twins were living uh, on the Upper West Side, and Suzanne Barsh, who was a major influence on fashion in New York and also on the on the street pictures, threw parties at nightclubs and does till this day. And she fell in love with them and would sneak them in to bars at night and they would go clubbing at the age of 15 or 16. They were very young. Oh my God. And there's, they're hilarious together because they can finish each other's sentences. They leave parts out. It's like their own language. Mm -hmm. Wow. So they're both 15 in this picture? Yeah. But what, what I love about looking at these pictures is that I can... I remember being there by the out-of-focus backgrounds. I love this image. Yeah. So much attitude. That's what's so great. So I think cool. Really pleasantly in your face. Yeah. That I really enjoy. They seem so comfortable too. Mm -hmm. With themselves. Mm -hmm. At such a young age. Mm. 
This woman I bumped into in Chelsea, which was not my usual stomping grounds, and I was just so taken with her beauty and her style. It was so simple. It was so unlike the punk style that I was known for photographing. Mm -hmm. Innocent beauty is really something. Yeah, There's so many people are really taken by this. That is such a different persona on the street when you see her, very different than other characters. Um, what attracted you to her? The feminine, the masculine, the, the ease with which <laughs> the ease with which she was a woman in what was known as boys clothing mm -hmm. um, but you know from the neck up she's totally feminine I love the composition and the human in this in this image um, I didn't realize she was female and she was pregnant with twins. So, and then our story got interrupted when you were telling me about it. Can you say more? Sure. I met Jan Long. Uh, we were both really young. We were in Boston. I had gone to college. I was waitressing at the time, and she was working at a clothing store called Goods in Harvard Square. And we just talked about working together and making style pictures. Uh, not fashion per se, but she had this great job where she could borrow clothing and she looked good in everything. And every time we photographed, mm -hmm. we picked a location and she would dress in clothing that went with the location. And so I developed my style of working with her and I brought these pictures to the Village Voice and that's how I got the job of On the Street. And Jan was oh, wow. working for Trash and Vaudeville, was, which was like the coolest punk store on St. Mark's Place in the early 80s. And I went by one day and just to chat with her, and I said, what would you wear if we were to do a picture for The Voice? And she said, oh, I've got to wear the shark skin suit. <laughs> And she was very proud of her little belly there. I love the composition, the way the lights go down and the building goes. So that one I just named by the place mm -hmm. because it was too complicated. All of the, I could have called it shark skin suit, but I was, I was sort of intrigued by the complexity of it. And I certainly didn't want to give her a masculine or a feminine uh, reference. Mm -hmm. Did you ask her to put her toe up and have that beautiful attitude in her body language? There was no need to tell Jan what to do <laughs> with her body. She was all about attitude and we knew each other so well and we worked together so much that it was completely natural. My little my little, my kiss, little, kiss, my kiss. Oh. He doesn't socially distance. Oh my goodness. <laughs> this is not socially correct. Oh, I'm just going to create a picture. <laughs> so, Milo, my name is Jim Giddings, and I'm here to talk with Amy and uh, ask her about several of the photographs from the show. Uh, I'm co director with uh, Patria Mitchell, and I have questions about this particular photograph called Miss Sears. Uh, it's, um, they look like they were born in those clothes. They look like they belong in those clothes. And so rather than have people who are posing and putting clothes on for the moment, it looks just like um, that's where they belong. And so that's my take on it. I just wanted to ask Amy. Um, what the story is with these two. I pronounce it Messers, Messers, which is the plural of Mr. and Mr. And they were, they turned out to be very well known um, in the art world. Um, it's David McDermott and Peter McGough. And they were partners for many years, both emotionally together and art partners. 
and they were hugely successful, but they were all about being from the earlier century. They took it so far that they lived without electricity and running water in the East Village. And they ended up getting a place <clears throat> upstate. And in order to travel upstate, they would take a horse and buggy. And I went to visit wow. them up there. And their photography was beautiful. It was, um, of course, uh, 19th century. And they used a big camera. And they did cyanotypes. They did very early work. And they did these beautiful still lives of people rather than portraits, if that makes sense. And sold like crazy. They made so much money that they ended up leaving the country because their taxes were so high. Um, Peter still lives in the village. I went, you know, we're still friendly. Um, he bought a, he wanted another copy of this picture, so he bought it at auction so he wouldn't have to pay full price. <laughs> and David lives in Ireland, as I recall. Um, they're still art partners, um, and they're legendary. Well, that's a special photograph. And, uh... So it turns out the story behind this photograph is that they had literally no money, like not enough to eat. They did somehow have an apartment, although I have a feeling they were squatting because they weren't paying electricity. But they went to church on Sunday so that they could eat. And they would have little nibbles in the coffee, and they were just walking down maybe Spring Street or Prince Street when I stopped them. And I noticed that the names were similar. You know, it was a business with two, you know, the same name. And I thought how perfect to show these two guys from an earlier century with names by, behind their head, which is something I wouldn't ordinarily do. So when I found Madonna on St. Mark's Place, um, I told her that I was working for the Village Voice, and her response was, oh, that's weird. They're running a review of my first single this week. I had already developed this technique, not that I developed it for myself, of making pictures where I balanced the light in the background to the foreground. So I, I used on-camera flash. And I did it because the reproduction in the newspaper was pretty lousy. <laughs> and I needed details in the blacks and the whites. And there's mostly top lighting in New York. And, you know, there were people of all skin colors. And a little bit of flash just made them pop out of the background a bit. I also um, often photograph the way that my eyesight is, which is sharp in the foreground and a little blurry in the background. And that also gives this feeling of them coming out at you. I was using releases in those days so I could get contact information. And she signed the release with her full name. And I never heard her last name after that except that she had dropped it. She totally commands the frame. And one of the interesting things that people remark about when they see the show is how, sort of like a uh, man's hat and tie, how she just stands there not posing, um, just standing. It's like you stopped her, she stopped moving, and said, take my picture, and then probably moved on. And it's remarkable, because with as little effort, how she totally commands the scene and your view. And um, she's still got her pajamas on.
Exactly. <laughs> That's, riot. That's what She's she got told a good, me. A Goodwill coat and a, and a bowling ball bag for a purse and frayed and she's uh, still uh, you know trying to get her demos heard as far as I understand and and you say that she was just uh, getting her first hit reviewed in Village Voice. And so. then I heard she was um, sleeping on the floor of her studio and and she looked so great to me I didn't think oh there's stains on the coat. I just thought, look at the two-tone hair. Yeah. Look at that uh, look in her eyes. She, and I. She makes she makes this. Um, it looks like a you know balled up curtain, an old curtain, look like an elegant scarf. Exactly. Amazing. Yeah. She she knew how to work it. She did. She made it work. <laughs> it's a fabulous photograph. It's I an only incredible photograph. Sorry. I only took seven frames. I mean, that was all that was necessary. And, you know, maybe in hindsight, this affects the way I look at the photograph, but the fact that she's famous seems totally present in the way she's looking at the camera. Like, she knew, like, I'm going to be a star. Yeah. And I recently, several years ago, got a job um, where, for a design company where they were making oversized coats again. And they admitted to sort of borrowing the idea uh -huh. from the cover shot of my book. Wow. <laughs> so I wanted to ask Amy one question, or maybe just make an observation. When you were shooting these individuals, basically you would introduce yourself, is that correct, mm -hmm. and tell people what you were going to do, and that set up what you suggested was almost, it was making it fun. And my take on what happens is you develop intimacy. And what's remarkable about this suite of photographs is how intimate it feels. It feels to me like you know the people, or even within the frame of that moment, you got to know them really well. And they were willing to, to, to share uh, that space and that moment with you. And I, I thought that it was true with a few of them as I saw them. And the more I become familiar with the show, the more it appears that it's a truth throughout the entire exhibit. Aww. That's so sweet. Um, I was very interested in having my subjects feel at ease. Yeah. And if I saw, I'm an expert at seeing tension, either in a shoulder, in a hand, in a stance. And if I saw something looking tense, a lot of people do get tension in their jaw. I would just show them what, you know, how to release the tension or tell them. Like, I'd say, try something else with, with that left leg or um, maybe take your hand out of your pocket. And that time was how they, I think, how they felt like I knew what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And because, again, I was sharing the pictures with the subjects by offering to send them one, they had something at stake. They had a reason to want to make this a great photograph. Yeah. And I think that's where you get to the place where we're either playing a game or we're working on something together and we both want it to succeed. And they also knew I wouldn't stop anyone that I didn't think was, looked great. Um, and to me, it was saying to them, I want to take your image home with me and live with it for the rest, the rest of my life. I love that quote. <laughs> So these guys were 
also business partners and um, partners in love, and they are to this day. And they, it turns out they are set designers for, of course, only the greatest films. I know for sure they worked on Hedwig and the Angry Inch. Kurt and Bart. <laughs> Do you keep in touch with them? No, I wish I did. I just re-met um, John Cameron Mitchell, who I photographed for something else. And um, I, you know, it, it's now 30 years later, and I said to him, I loved working with you so much. It was such, an, such a thrill, because he was so, he participated so much. He knew we were doing um, the original production and he knew which way to light him from, he knew which wig to wear, he knew what gesture, you know, I wasn't proud. If they knew how they looked best, it's like a movie star saying, I need the soft focus, I need the soft lighting, you know, it's a gift to a photographer because you have to make your decisions on a dime and they've seen themselves many times. So he was just, also he's brilliant and Working with somebody that smart is just so fascinating and so thrilling. So Julio worked for Suzanne Barsh at her store. Her claim to fame is that she brought Vivian Westwood, who was like the coolest British designer, to Soho in the 80s. And Julio was another young kid, boy, um, and I walked into the store just to say hi to her, and I looked at his clothing, and I said, my goodness, how gorgeous is it from the back? And I looked around in the immediate vicinity, and I needed a reason to photograph him from behind. And there was a garage door, and I thought, how perfect. And I love the way, this is the photographic gifts, you know, when, the shape mirrors the shape and all these little details of this complex design. Mm -hmm. And then he looked in so innocently. It was just, I don't know, I was very moved by it. Yeah, you know, the garment is really interesting, whether it's pulled designed that way or whether it's pulled because his arm is up. Yeah, why is his last name Q? It's just curious. He, that's all he gave me. Oh, wow, okay. So you didn't develop a relationship with him? He passed away. Oh. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Very young. Oh my gosh, it's a beautiful, it's a stunning image. I love that he's on his, his tippy toes. Yeah, yeah. so sweet. Hmm. This one was really different for me. I lived on the Upper West Side in the 80s, and I really wasn't, Although I'd grown up in New York City, I wasn't part of this creative scene downtown that was happening. And one day I was coming home and there was this guy who was completely not belonging to anything. And I just loved that he had this hilarious style of what looked to me like no pants. Like, oops, forgot the pants. <laughs> so. For me, I loved the offbeat, unexpected people that were not necessarily part of the scene. In the, initially, I was trying to um, get to know these people that were, I knew were going to get famous, uh, go on to do great, great things, really creative things. But then I started getting really fascinated by people that were not part of anything. And that's how this came to be. It was right on my block. Was this somebody that you knew? No. No, not at all. And how come you named it Moccasins? Well, I didn't know how to get into like bikini bathing suit. I didn't know what that was. Um, so I just stuck with the, I mean, I could have called it animal print mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. something. But I didn't know really what to call it. Mm -hmm. I think he's a very interesting character. Did he, was he appreciative of that you wanted to shoot him? 
Yeah. Did he immediately, okay, hold still or you did know, you have to massage him a bit to get him interested in having his picture taken? No, that was the magic. I mean, the fact that I was working for the Village Voice, the fact that it was the 80s, the fact that they could be celebrated just for their style, mm -hmm. not for their personality, gave me access to a lot more people. So uh, that was a gift. I, you know, now it's much more, people are most, much more suspect of what your motives are. Mm -hmm. Then it was perfectly innocent. And I was offering to share the prints with them. So they would give me an address or a phone number or something, and I would send them a print. Initially, when I started working for The Voice, it, I, they were publishing my pictures every six weeks. And their choice was to say, there are eight million fashions in the Naked City, and Amy Arbus is going to photograph all of them one at a time. And my father said, oh my god, that's the best publicity anybody could ever hope for. But as the years progressed, they made it into a full page. and. Um, one of the joys of working for the Village Voice was that I worked with the art directors, um, uh, Mary Peacock and Wes Anderson in the early days, and we decided how to lay out the photographs. And one thing that really helped me ab about having to do that was that it clarified how I should think about making a page. So I started doing it thematically. And I would go out with my camera and just not photograph. The first day, I would go out once a month and I would just look. But it was important that I had my camera with me so that I would look intently and visually and decide what I was seeing. Was it hats? Was it stripes, was it uh, animal prints, was it, you know, what w were people doing? Was it chunky jewelry? Was it uh, hair? Um, so I would photograph with themes in mind, and then what, what's amazing about this one is one of my, one of my favorite photographs appears here as a tiny little postage stamp. And I just think that's so great that Flip got the, the big shot and his family got the little shot. Um, this is Suzanne Barsh, who I've mentioned before in, in uh, her tit suit. And this is Phoebe Legere, who was a perform is still a performer. And she was wearing her fur bikini. And I have another picture of her where she's playing the accordion. <laughs> so I had a question, Amy. I, I see this as a, an opportunity to ask you. I didn't realize that you were treating this as an assignment for once a month or once every, what did you say, six weeks? Mm -hmm. um, and that's interesting. So what were you doing for the other five and a half weeks, or did you if you found something or you didn't find something, did you go out the next day and the next until you were able to satisfy that particular assignment that you had given yourself, you know, the, the hats or the stripes or whatever? I think I was doing other jobs at the time. I, it was the very beginning of my career, but up until then I had worked for a fashion photographer and that was a real living. Mm -hmm. This was a nice job. It wasn't about the money, it was about the health insurance, honestly. So it was a freelance job, but it was steady work. Mm -hmm. It wasn't enormous amounts of money, but I did all of the film processing and all of the printing myself, so I would make money for a fee and then for expenses. Um, but when I made the photographs, I would spend a week on it. And the first day, like I said, I wouldn't actually take the camera out of the bag. 
um, which I would never do at this point. Mm -hmm. I would always have the camera around my neck with the lens cap off. Otherwise, you know, you're, you're going to get lazy. And you're too lazy to take the camera out of the bag. You're too lazy to switch the lens. You know, you might want to know what I was working with. Um, I have always been a Nikon girl. I've um, worked with Leica. I've worked with all kinds of cameras, Sony's. Um, anyway, any camera. Um, I started with a brownie box camera when I was in high school. Um, but for these images, I was very fond of the FM2 which was, um, eventually I got a motor drive for it, um, so I could work very quickly. And I used a normal lens and a low um, camera angle to make my subjects look like superheroes or more important than they even look to me. So a colleague of mine, Richard Sandler, who's also a street photographer and a cinematographer, um, we've known each other for years. We taught together at International Center of Photography. He dated a friend of mine. You know, we would see, see each other all the time at events, on the street. Um, I never knew he took my picture until literally about a month ago, I, he posted it on Facebook. So this is me in the 80s. Um, but the most amazing thing about it is that he might have been one of my subjects and that I'm standing in front of the building that I've been living in for almost 30 years now. And there was no knowledge of either thing back in the 80s. It's just completely kismet. This show is so gorgeous and you know when your pictures sit in boxes for a long time <laughs> you just want you want them so desperately to get out into the world and this is the most glorious space and I love working with Jim and Petey um, it's just you know I'm getting the chills um, it's just really lovely being in this space with this lighting um, they did such a nice job of hanging the pictures everything you know, people are particularly enthusiastic about certain pieces and how it was done. So the opportunity to talk about the process is really fun. I just want to thank all the people that were there then, that remember, that have the same, um, what is it called? The same nostalgia for this time in our lives when there was a certain freedom, a certain innocence that we will never experience again. So thank you so much for tuning in.